Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so just a reminder that the homework is due today, so don't forget to add yours to the pile here. Um, I also just want to remind you that next time on Friday, you have your first midterm exam, and I'll spend time at the end of class today talking a little bit more about that. Um, so let's just jump right back into our discussion of the vapor compression and refrigeration cycle. So first of all, we've done the same thing as we've analyzed the, well, vapor compression refrigeration cycle as we did in analyzing the heat engine cycles. Um, when we dealt with heat engines back in your first course in thermodynamics, we weren't really so concerned with the actual equipment that's involved with the heat transfer or the work. Um, we were just interested in the quantities so that we could calculate things like coefficient of performance or thermal efficiency or whatever was of interest to us. Um, now we're beginning to look at what's actually inside the black box. That is, what, what does the heat engine cycle look like in reality? Or now, what does the refrigeration cycle look like in reality? Um, the heat engine cycle has many shapes and sizes and forms, right? We've seen auto cycles, diesel cycles, Brayton cycles, Rankine cycles. Um, but in each one of those situations, we're not just interested anymore in the magnitude of the work of the heat transfer. We're, we're trying to figure out how to calculate that magnitude. Um, you know, using the first law of thermodynamics, how do we determine the work or the heat for the different processes? Um, so that's the same thing that we're doing here in the refrigeration cycles. Right? We're trying to understand the basic cycle. Now, the vapor compression refrigeration cycle is really pretty straightforward. Um, we've got two heat exchangers, and we've got a compressor, and we've got a throttle. I mean, that's the basic vapor compression refrigeration cycle, right? Um, we have heat input on the low end of the cycle. Uh, we have heat output or heat rejection on the high end of the cycle. We've got work input um, via our compressor. And of course, the throttle is just there to drop the pressure from the pressure of the high pressure heat exchanger, which is what we call a condenser, down to the pressure of the low temperature heat exchanger, which is our evaporator. So condenser, evaporator, compressor, throttle. And this is the basic cycle that we're talking about now, right? We have to analyze the first law to figure out how much heat is being transferred within the evaporator and the condenser. And we also need to analyze the first law to determine how much work is required in the compressor. Once we've done that, um, once we calculate all of our various enthalpy terms, which is really what this is all about, we can then determine, well, the coefficient of performance. Now, we've looked at the ideal case. This is what we did last time. Um, it was this cycle, but we assume that everything was ideal. Uh, we assume that the pressure leaving one device is exactly the same as the pressure entering the next device. Uh, we assume that the condenser and the evaporator were indeed constant pressure devices. Um, you know, it was a very ideal kind of a process. We, we didn't consider the isentropic efficiency or, if you will, the losses in the compressor. Um, what I want to do is begin to look at the non-ideal cycle now. And the first thing I want to do is just talk in general about a, a real vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Okay, so we're, we're still dealing, obviously, with the vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Um, but what I want to do is just talk briefly about what it would look like in the real world um, as compared to our ideal world. And then we'll try to figure out what we can possibly do in order to analyze the non-ideal cycle. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to put thermodynamic state points around this diagram that are not going to be the same as what you've used before. Okay? This is really just for illustration. Um, let's just still assume, whoops, let's still assume that one is what enters the compressor. Um, we leave the compressor at state point two. Um, we would further note that as we move through piping from the compressor to the condenser, there may be some pressure loss in the real world. So state point three is not going to be the same as state point two anymore. 
Um, we leave the condenser at point four, and again, we've got to travel some distance through piping or tubing to get to the throttle, so we're, we're going to have some losses. The pressure is certainly going to drop as we move through the piping from four to five. Um, and then we cross the throttle, so we'll have um, the same enthalpy, but a much lower pressure at point six. But then furthermore, we drop the pressure as we go through all this tubing to get from the throttle to the evaporator. So from six to seven, there's going to be some more losses. And then as we move through the evaporator, we're going to have our heat transfer take place. We'll leave the evaporator at state point eight. But then we recognize that we again have some distance to travel in the piping. And we're going to have some pressure losses as we go from eight back into one. So in the real cycle, it's really going to be different than the ideal cycle, right? Um, first of all, if we just go through each of these individual processes, let's just say one to two in the compressor, well, we certainly understand that this is going to be, um, well, real, right? It's not truly an isentropic process. So that's something that we know how to deal with. We, we just use isentropic efficiencies. Um, now, as we go from two to three, we'll have our pressure losses. So I'll just put delta P just to represent pressure loss. In fact, while I'm going through this list, why don't I also just show this on a TS diagram relative to the saturation lines. And let's also put a couple of pressures on here. Um, we'll put the minimum as well as the maximum pressure in the cycle. Okay. So what about one to two? Well, I mean, we know that state point one as we, um, well, as we leave the evaporator at state point eight, I should really say that we have a saturated liquid. That's the nature of evaporators. But we're going to actually move through and lose some pressure. Um, so the actual state point one is not necessarily going to be right on the saturated vapor line. Um, if the pressure drops, you know, we may end up actually being slightly superheated. So state point one is going to be there. Um, now we go through the compressor, and of course we know that it's not an ideal compressor. So we're going to leave the compressor at the discharge pressure. And now we're going to pass through some more piping as we go from two to three. And we have some pressure loss, right? Delta P, I'll just put delta P loss. We have a pressure loss. So the pressure is going to drop. Um, we're going to lose a little bit of our pressure. We'll likely drop a little bit of temperature because no piping system is truly um, insulated, right? There's always some heat losses. So we'll probably end up with a state point three that's like down here somewhere. Um, actually at a slightly lower pressure and, um, you know, even a slightly lower temperature. So that's going to be state point three. And now we're going to go through the condenser from three to four. Now a condenser is just a big open device. Um, there's going to be minimal pressure loss within that condenser. So um, we'll just note that this is our constant pressure process. So that's just going to be constant pressure. So we're going to go from point 0.3. And then point 0.4 is going to be a saturated liquid. But again, it's going to be at a slightly lower pressure than that maximum pressure line, right? So we're going to have state point 0.4 over there. Although that's not even completely correct, because typically, you know, what we'd find in the real world is that point 0.4 is probably going to be slightly subcooled. So yes, it's a constant pressure device. But 0.4 is not really going to be right on the saturation line. It's actually going to be slightly into the subcooled region. Okay. So yes, there's a constant pressure, but again, it's subcooled at the exit. In other words, at four solids, but subcooled at four. Okay. All right. So now we go through some more piping, right? We go through some more piping, and this too would cause the pressure to drop. So if, if this represents a constant pressure line, um, as we go from 0.4 to 5, the pressure is actually going to drop. And we'll end up down here somewhere at 0.5. Okay, so that's below the constant pressure of 0.4. So 
it's not constant pressure, I shouldn't even use that word anymore, there's going to be another pressure loss. All right, so we lose pressure, we go from four to five, and now we go through the throttle, and the throttle, of course, is going to drop <coughs> the pressure, but it's also going to increase the entropy, so 0.6 is going to be down here somewhere. Um, please note that we're not going to go all the way down to the pressure of the evaporator. We'll be a little bit above the pressure of the evaporator because, again, we have real-world pressure losses as we flow through pipes. So we're going to go through that device. Um, certainly, we're going to end up... Um, I'm sorry. Certainly... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't show 6 to 7 yet. So we're going to drop some pressure here a little bit more. But we're not going to go all the way down to the, uh, well, I'm sorry. And we're going <laughs> to, not doing well today. All right, so back to point six. So we leave the throttle. Um, we represent point six as it's shown on the TS diagram. And now we have another pressure loss. So this is where we're going to lose pressure down to the pressure of the evaporator. So point seven is going to be down here at this pressure. Um, in fact, that's not completely right either, is it? Because we are going to lose pressure ultimately to get to the inlet pressure of the compressor. So point seven is actually going to be a little bit higher than the pressure entering the compressor. And then we're going to move through the evaporator. We're going to pick up heat and we're going to get to point eight over here, but again, that's going to be at a slightly higher pressure than one, and then we go through more piping, and we lose a little pressure, and we finally get to state point one. Now, quite frankly, eventually, after you've taken all of your fluid mechanics classes, you will be able to determine what kind of pressure losses will be seen within these sections of pipe. Um, there may even be a slight pressure loss within these heat exchangers themselves, which could be considered, um, but that's really beyond the level of this course. Um, all we can do in this particular course is do what we've done all along. We just have to simply assume that whatever the state is leaving one device is the same as the state entering the next device, right? Uh, points four and five are the same, six and seven are the same, eight and one are the same, two and three are the same, and we really have no choice but to assume that. So nonetheless, let me finish all this. Um, as we go from 5 to 6, um, H is constant because it's a throttle. As we go from 6 to 7, then we have another pressure loss. Um, and then as we go from 7 to 8, um, the pressure is more or less constant. Um, and then ultimately from 8 back to 1, we have another pressure loss. Um, again, though, we can't really calculate these pressure losses. So in this class, all we really have the ability to do, in all honesty, is analyze a non-ideal compressor. That, that's all we can do. So in this class, a real, that is a non-ideal cycle, will only include the isentropic efficiency of the compressor. Okay? No other losses will be considered. So I do think it's important that we at least go through one cycle and try to understand the nature of the losses as we go through them because eventually you will have to understand this. Um, I could have done this with any one of the heat engine cycles, you know, gone from point to point, although in the other direction, and just identified the nature of losses, but it's the same as what we're talking about here. Okay? In a real steam power plant, a gas turbine power plant, whatever cycle you look at, there are definitely going to be more losses than you are considering just based on what you've learned in thermodynamics. Again, you'll get there as we deal with fluid losses. So if the only real ability that we have is to analyze the cycle with a non-ideal compressor, um, we already know how to deal with a non-ideal compressor. We, we've done that before. So let me just do an example problem. And what I really want to do is exactly the same example problem that I did last time. Let's do 1114 from addition 7. Okay. Again, same as last time. Um, but I want to now do it with a isentropic efficiency for the compressor. So, but 
with the compressor isentropic efficiency of 85%. So this is the only difference. And in fact, this is the only difference that we would have in any one of these cycle problems dealing with the non-ideal versus ideal cycle. We're just going to deal with the, compre uh, the, the compressor. So where do we begin? Um, first of all, I'm not even going to bother to put this on the screen. You already have this in your notes from last time. Um, just as a reminder, we're looking at this refrigeration cycle that uses R134A and it operates between a minimum pressure of 0.12 and a maximum of 0.7 megapascals. Uh, you're given a certain mass flow rate of 0.05 kilograms per second, and you're just asked to find the rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space, which we know means the rate of heat input into the cycle, and we're trying to find the rate of heat rejection out into the environment, so that would be heat output, and then also the coefficient of performance. Now, much of the problem is the same, which is another reason why I really don't see any point in going through the whole process again. Um, we will simply note that, well, first of all, we're not even using this diagram, right? We, we have too many state points over there. Let me redraw the diagram anyway. Okay. So again, relative to our max and min pressure lines, here would be my point one. We would have some sort of compression up to the actual state point two, but again, we know we have to first assume that it's ideal, isentropic, to go from one to two s, and then we'll figure out how to get from two s to two a using the efficiency of the compressor. Um, we then go over here to point three, we expand down to point four, and then finally we make it back to point one. Okay. So first of all, it should be noted that most of the states that we've already seen are exactly the same, right? States 1 and 3 and 4 are the same, okay, as a previous problem, right? We, we know saturated vapor at the given pressure of 0.7 megapascals. Here's saturated liquid at, um, I said that wrong. Over here, saturated vapor at 0.12 megapascals. Here, saturated liquid at 0.7 megapascals. Um, we know that H3 and H4 are the same, so none of that changes at all. And in fact, if these state points are the same, then certainly the heat input is going to have to be the same, right? State 1 and 4 are the same, and the heat input takes place from 4 to 1. So the Q dot into the cycle, as well as the heat input per unit mass are going to be the same. The only things that aren't going to be the same are those terms that deal with state point two, which of course would be the heat rejection that we're trying to find, as well as our work input. So most is the same, but not state point two. So state two from before is now what we just call 2s, right? Okay, so in other words, H2S, which was just H2 from before, we found is 273.50 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. So all we have to do then is go into the isentropic efficiency equation. So the ideal over the actual work is just H2S minus H1 over H2 actual minus H1. Um, again, we have all the data we need here, so 273.50 minus H1, which we found is 236.97 last time, over H2A minus 236.97, and therefore uh, the actual enthalpy is a little different than it was before. Um, we end up with 279.95. Uh, previously, the enthalpy at 2 was found to be, where did that go? Oh, 273.50. So, you know, we're off by a couple percent. Um, certainly this is more accurate. All right, so now that we have the enthalpy at 2A, now it's just a matter of finishing up the problem. Um, we can find the work input on a per unit mass basis as just H2A minus H1. So again, we have H2A and H1 already, so this just becomes 42.98 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, the heat input we already had from before. And we found that the heat input 
um, from before was 148.15 kilojoules per kilogram. Again, this is just H1 minus H4. Okay. So we can easily find the coefficient of performance for this particular refrigeration cycle. Um, we know that since this is a refrigerator, then we're going to use heat input divided by work input. So just take the ratio of the two numbers that are above, and we get to, I'm sorry, 3.45. So here's the coefficient of performance. Um, we also need to find the rate of heat rejection. So Q dot out is just M dot times Q out. In other words, M dot times H 2A minus H3. And now again, M dot's given in the problem statement. H2A we found above. H3 we have from last time. So again, just plug in the numbers. And we find that the rate of heat output is 9.56 kilojoules per second. Okay, And I think that's all they've asked us to find, right? Rate of heat output. Uh, the rate of heat input is the same, and coefficient of performance we've now found, so there's your problem. Uh, now again, you'll have to look at this in conjunction with the example problem that we did last time. I, I would hope that all of you have your notes from last time, and you were just able to kind of flip back and forth and see what all these numbers were. If you don't have your notes, then you'll probably have to go look at this again and just kind of make sure that all the numbers are correct. But the methodology is really quite straightforward. So. All the difficulty that we see in the real world associated with losses in the pipelines are going to simply be ignored, at least for us, um, well, until some point in the future. So any questions on any of this? All right. So this then brings us to the last topic dealing with refrigeration cycles. And this is a different type of refrigeration cycle. Now, it's not that much different, but it is different enough such that it does require some attention. Again, this is called an absorption refrigeration cycle. Okay. Now, if we think about our vapor compression refrigeration cycle, um, you know the cycle described by this TS diagram then we should recognize that we have a pretty significant work input. Okay? In fact, the work input is the only thing that we really have to pay for. If there was some way that we could minimize that work input, then clearly that would reduce the denominator and then increase the coefficient of performance, which is really what we want. Right? Now the question is, what means do we have available to us to minimize that work input? Now, I suppose some of you are thinking, oh, maybe we can do something like intercooling like we did on compressors. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that that is wrong. I mean, certainly it is a possibility that one could minimize the compressor work. But we still have to compress a gas. Okay? We still have a vapor going from point one to two. Is there some way, perhaps, that we could require that work, but on something other than a gas? And this requires an understanding of the way gases and liquids um, well, mixed together. Um, hopefully we understand that vapors can easily be absorbed into liquids. Okay? We, we've talked about it before just in passing in this class. We, we know that soda pop is just a gas carbon dioxide that's dissolved into a liquid. Um, seltzer water is the same thing, right? Um, so we know that that process can occur. So these are kind of hints to get you thinking about, well, maybe we can just completely eliminate the compressor entirely. Can we just take the vapor that comes out of the evaporator at state point one, and instead of running it into a compressor, can we just dissolve that vapor into a liquid? And liquids require very little work to pump. I mean, just look, um, let's say, at the Brayton cycle 
and its work input term versus a Rankine cycle and its work input term. We, we know that in the Brayton cycle, because you're compressing a gas, uh, the amount of power that's required to compress that gas could, could easily be half of the total power output from the turbine. But we also recall by looking at the Rankine cycle that the amount of work required by a pump is practically inconsequential compared to the work output for a turbine. And the reason is because pumps move high density liquids. Um, the amount of work is a function of the specific volume times the pressure change. And since you have a much, much lower specific volume, um, in other words, a higher density for a liquid, um, then we should be able to do that work on the liquid and require much, much less work input. So that's the nature of the absorption refrigeration cycle, and that's why you even use the word absorption. We're going to absorb a vapor, that is the actual refrigerant coming out of the evaporator, will be absorbed into a liquid, will pump the liquid up to the high pressure, and then will simply remove the vapor that was previously put into that liquid. Okay. So the vapor <coughs> leaving the evaporator is absorbed into a liquid. The liquid is pumped, and I'll note here using much less work. Anyway, the liquid is pumped up to the condenser's pressure. And then it is removed from the liquid and this will be before entering the condenser. Okay, so what would this look like first from a schematic point of view? So let's again, let's show our different devices so these are our devices. So again, this is our evaporator and our condenser and the throttle. Okay, so here we've got state point one, here we've got state point two and three and four. So those aren't gonna change. And here is what's changing right in here. No more compressor. So what do we have? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's just look inside the cloud. And I'll make it quite a bit larger because there's really quite a bit of equipment in here. So first we have state point one. And this would now represent the discharge from the evaporator. So this is a saturated vapor. And the first thing we do is send it into a device that's called the absorber. Okay. Now, the substance used in the absorber is a liquid, and it's going to be a different substance than the refrigerant itself. So that's certainly something worth noting. Um, I don't want you to think that we're going to take some refrigerant liquid and we're going to absorb the refrigerant vapor into it. No, no, it's a completely separate liquid. Um, there, there's actually only two combinations that are used widely in industry. Um, one is um, called ammonia absorption, where ammonia is actually the refrigerant and water is the absorber. Um, then there's another one that's called lithium bromide system, where water is actually the refrigerant and the water is absorbed into a liquid called lithium bromide. So these are the two types of systems that exist. We, we don't have to worry about how they are different from one another. Uh, we just have to understand that both have the ability to absorb a vapor refrigerant into that absorber liquid. Okay. So we have the absorber and the absorber is going to contain some sort of a liquid and we're going to pass the vapor through the liquid. Usually it would just kind of be bubbled through the liquid. And in doing so, 
the liquid absorbs the vapor. Okay. So now we have just the liquid that comes out. Okay. Now, before I move on, there is one little issue that we need to understand. Um, when you dissolve a gas into a liquid, uh, heat is actually rejected. Okay. So this is going to give off a significant amount of heat. So you definitely have to have some sort of a heat sink to put that heat into. So also associated with this, we would typically show a little cooling coil, if you will. And this cooling coil represents some sort of heat that's rejected. Okay. So the process is simply one that releases energy. And there's nothing you can do about it. We just have to make sure that we recognize it. Right? We need the equipment to remove the heat. All right, so this is heat that's being rejected. Um, now we have this liquid, and now we send the liquid into a pump. So here is a pump. And of course, the pump requires some work input. Uh, but again, the amount of work input is going to be significantly less than what it was if we happen to just compress the vapor. All right, so I have work input to a pump, and this brings me to a higher pressure. And now we're going to liberate that vapor through another device. So this device up here at the top is called a generator. Essentially, we're regenerating the vapor. So this is our generator. Okay. So here, again, we're going to have a liquid and a vapor. Now, it turns out to separate the liquid and the vapor, you need to supply heat. In the same way that heat is liberated by putting that vapor into the liquid, um, conversely, heat has to be provided to move the vapor out of the liquid. So once again, I'll show a little set of tubes here. And this is going to represent some sort of heat that has to be supplied. Okay, So some sort of heat supply. And this is going to then cause the vapor to come out of solution. So here's the vapor. And basically, we're right back to state point two again. Okay. Now, let's note that the liquid, the absorber liquid that gets pumped up to this generator, um, we're not going to just waste it. We're not going to just dump it into the environment. Um, please note that this generator is at higher pressure than the liquid um, in the absorber. Um, as such, you could just run a pipe between the generator and the absorber and just simply make that liquid come back down into the absorber. So let's just call this liquid recirculation. Okay. So it certainly should make sense that this will save you money. The only problem is that it's also going to cost you money, right? Um, because unfortunately, even though there's much less work required, Um, it also requires that we have two separate heat exchangers, right? Okay, right? And these two heat exchangers are the absorber and the generator. Okay. And of course, having a heat exchanger doesn't mean that that's the only thing that you need. You need to have some sort of a heat supply. You know, what is going to supply the heat within that generator? So are you going to burn a fuel? Are you going to use waste heat from some other portion of your process? So uh, a heat supply is needed. And a heat sink is needed, right? Somehow we have to reject heat. So are we going to have to have a pipe from the local river that moves through the absorber and picks up the heat that's being generated in there? Um, are we going to have a cooling tower or some other device to transfer heat to water? So a heat sink is also needed. Okay. So yes, much less worse work is required, but it does cost you a lot of money to use this type of a cycle, or I should say use this type of a system. Yes? What, what does that say, like two? Two heat exchangers. Yeah, just HX. HX is my abbreviation for heat exchangers. So two heat exchangers are going to have to be used. Okay. So anyway, there's a large cost associated with these. And quite frankly, 
the cost is high enough that it completely wipes out the savings you would have from requiring less work, except in one general situation. Um, in many facilities, you actually have some sort of waste heat that is available. Um, let's say this was a steam power plant. Um, you may have some waste heat from, let's say, the combustion gases in your furnace that are just being blown out into the atmosphere. Um, if you don't have to buy a separate heat supply and you can just use some sort of waste heat, yeah, you still have to buy the heat exchanger, the, the generator itself, but the heat supply is essentially free. So if you do that, then it becomes economical. So if waste heat is used as the heat supply, then the system is economical. Okay, otherwise, honestly, it's just a waste of money. So you would have to do your own cost-benefit analysis. You'd have to go through the analysis of your vapor compression system as well as your absorption system. And you know, based on the difference in the amount of work, but also the increase in the amount of cost, you'll just have to figure out for yourself whether that application makes sense in your particular situation. Okay. So is there any question just in general about how this whole process works? And then let me also just talk about the substances. So um, <coughs> one common setup is to have ammonia as the refrigerant and just to have water as the absorber. Okay. Um, so if that were the case, then, well, clearly ammonia is moving through the actual cycle, but that ammonia is getting absorbed into water um, to use in the absorber and then re-emitted in the generator. Okay. Now, there are problems with this. I mean, this is ammonia, right? Ammonia is toxic, it's, it's flammable, it's combustible. Um, most people don't really recognize how dangerous ammonia is. I mean, you guys buy it as window cleaner, or you can even buy it just as a clear liquid, but it's what, maybe 5% ammonia, 0.5% ammonia. I mean, it's a very, very weak solution. So you can breathe it, and it's, it's strong, but it's not going to kill you. Um, pure ammonia, I mean, you're dead within seconds. You, you, you breathe that in, and you're, you're dead. Lungs can't handle it. Um, so there's a big problem if we have an ammonia absorption system, especially if there's some sort of a leak. Um, there have been ammonia leaks in various locations. Um, there was a huge one in the city of Brea, not, well, it was long ago now that I think about it, 50 years ago, something like that. Um, so things do happen, but um, nonetheless, this is one common mixture. Um, I would note that for those of you that are into chemistry, if we want to just look at the process that I've been talking about, this absorption process, um, if we take ammonia as a vapor and mix it with water, um, it creates ammonium hydroxide and it releases heat. Okay. So this is just a process that we perhaps have seen in chemistry, but that heat that's released is the heat that's rejected. That's why we need the heat exchanger and we need our heat sink. Um, if we reverse this process, if we take the ammonium hydroxide, um, NH4OH, and we now add heat to it, then this is going to reverse the process and we'll end up with the ammonia and the water again as a liquid. So again, you can see that you, you absolutely need a heat supply. Without a heat supply, this chemical reaction is not going to work, and you're never going to be able to generate the ammonia that you just absorbed into the water moments ago. Okay, so this is one common setup. Um, so again, it works, but it's not perfect. Because it's toxic and flammable. So maybe there's another option. The other option would be 
the lithium bromide system. So here uh, we would have the other common one. So here we have water as the refrigerant and lithium bromide as the absorber. Okay. So I could create a, a similar set of reaction equations if I wanted to and you know, describe the process, but it's the same general process. Water is the actual refrigerant, it's what's moving through the cycle, um, and then it gets absorbed into lithium bromide. Now lithium bromide is really not too dangerous a stuff. The, the problem is that if you're using water as a refrigerant, then how do we transfer heat out of water at a temperature consistent with the refrigeration cycle. I mean, keep in mind that at the temperatures associated with the refrigeration cycle, um, what would that be? Maybe 100, 120 degrees, perhaps down to 40 or so degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the saturation pressure corresponding to those temperatures is less than atmospheric, right? We, we know that at standard atmosphere, 14.7 PSI, that water is going to change phase at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's much higher than the temperatures that we really need for this type of a cycle, right? So we have no real choice but to put a vacuum pumping system onto the entire cycle and drop the pressure down to a point where the phase change can occur, um, right, in the condenser and evaporator, but it's gonna be able to occur at the temperatures necessary for your process. So that's the downside associated with this type of system, that the water has to be kept at a vacuum. And, you know, whenever you have a vacuum, you need some sort of a vacuum pumping system, and those tend to be rather expensive. So the water has to be kept at a vacuum um, in order to allow heat transfer at the temperatures associated, associated with the refrigeration cycle. Okay, and again, this costs money. So um, once again, you would have to do a cost-benefit analysis and determine whether the added costs and not just of your generator and absorber, as well as heat sink and heat supply are worth it, uh, but also whether it can overcome the extra cost having to do with the vacuum pumping system you need. Um, nonetheless, we certainly do find that these systems are available. Um, they are cheaper, um, especially on the large scale, um, but again, only if you tend to have uh, some sort of a heat supply that's coming from a waste heat source. Anyway, so are there any questions then in general about absorption cycles? Yes? So I take it this means that there isn't a very good liquid to absorb um, R134A? No. No. Um, I mean, it's possible that people are working on that. I personally don't know. Um, but that would make sense. I mean, if you can use the typical refrigerants that are available to us, like R134A, and if there is a liquid that can absorb them appropriately, then um, I would guess somebody, some chemical engineer who's doing that would probably make a ton of money if they finally got that to work properly. Um, but somebody's gonna have to invent the right substance to do so. So yeah, not, right now, nothing that I'm aware of exists. Um, any other questions? All right, so now the question becomes, how do we analyze such a system? And, well, I guess there's both good news and bad news. Um, we'll just start with the good news. We don't have the ability to do that in this class, okay? Um, to handle a system that has two different substances where one is absorbed into the other is well beyond this course. We're only dealing with pure substances in this class. Um, there's really no way that we can even analyze something like that. So I guess that is both the good news and the bad news. You know, it's the bad news because we don't have the ability to analyze such a system, but the good news is that we don't have to analyze the system. It's much more complicated than we really have the ability to handle. So all I'm gonna do then is just leave it at this. We should understand why these are important. We should understand how they work. We should understand advantages and disadvantages, but we're not gonna be able to analyze them, at least not in this class. So that then finishes the discussion of the refrigeration cycles. Um, are there any questions as we move on? 
All right, so I did say that I wanted to spend some time at the end of class today uh, talking about your exam. Um, I really don't want to start any new material, and it looks like we're not supposed to be starting anything new, at least until next week anyway. So why don't I then just talk about the exam and also answer any questions you might have, questions on homework problems, questions on example problems, just anything at all. Uh, we've got like 20 minutes, and you know, if we use all 20 minutes, great. If not, well, we'll have a little extra time. So um, the test is on Friday, so please make sure you're on time. Um, the test will be entirely closed book, closed notes, except that you are going to be given the property table handout. There's a copy of it on Blackboard if you just want to see which tables are in there. It's not the entire 100 pages of the appendix of your book, but um, you know, it's the ones that you will certainly need. So that's going to be provided to you. And you can all bring a 3 by 5 note card, 3 inches by 5 inches with um, equations and diagrams only. Um, you're not allowed any step-by-step -step outlined methods of solution or any sample problems or anything worked out for yourself. Um, it's only so that you don't have to memorize the various equations. So any equation you want, you can have diagrams on there. Um, I don't mind if you label your equations. Um, certainly you can do that. But again, you're not allowed to have any worked out example problems of any kind. And I do walk around at the beginning of an exam like this, and I'll pick up every one of your note cards briefly and just look at it. And if there's something on there that shouldn't be there, I always have a big black marking pen, and I'll just mark it right off. Um, if your card is greater than 3 by 5 inches, then I also typically bring a pair of scissors and my own 3 by 5 card. And I'll let you decide what part of your card you want to snip off. So um, please keep it to 3 by 5 inches. Uh, once again, if you want to just ma map out a 3 by 5 front and back on a piece of binder paper and then just stick within those 30 square inches, th that's fine. Um, but nonetheless, that's what you'll be allowed to bring with you. Um, so no textbook, no notes, just a 3 by 5 card and the handout. Um, as far as the number of problems, um, I'm just going to limit it to two problems. I mean, you only have an hour and five minutes, so I can't see having more than two. I mean, some quarters only give one long problem, um, but this quarter will have two. And it could cover anything through section 10.3. So um, first I'll note that, you know, we did a lot of review during the first week of this class. I'm not going to have any review questions or at least no material that deals specifically with the review, although we certainly understand that everything that I reviewed is material that we've been using slowly over these past several weeks. So I'm not going to have a problem just like the review problems, but certainly you need to understand all that material. Um, the problems are going to be cycle problems. Um, we covered the auto and the diesel cycle as well as the Brayton cycle within the topic of gas power cycles. Um, and then we covered the ranking cycle, um, the, the steam cycle. Um, but we're only going to go through section 10.3. So 10.3 is only the simple ranking cycle. So nothing dealing with reheat ranking cycles, nothing dealing with the regenerative ranking cycle, which means the various feed water heaters. Um, none of that's going to be on this midterm. I'll, I'll leave that for material in the next midterm. Um, so basically, auto cycle, diesel cycle, Brayton cycle, and the simple ranking cycle, that's all fair game. Um, within the gas power cycles, I could ask you to solve a problem using the method of variable specific heats, or as the author likes to say, considering variations with temperature. Um, you know, they use slightly different wording, but you know, it's the same thing, right? So we can either use variable specific heats, or I may ask you to solve the problem using constant specific heats. Um, the two methods are not interchangeable, and um, you do need to read the problem carefully. If it says variable specific heats, then use variable specific heats. You know, use table A17 data, use relative pressures, relative specific volumes. I mean, that's the nature of variable specific heats, right? If it says constant specific heats, then you're going to use equations, right? Like temperature ratio equals pressure ratio to the k minus 1 over k, or the volume ratio to the 1 minus k. Uh, those are the kind of relationships you would use to analyze isentropic processes if we have constant specific heat. So make sure you read the problems carefully and know what method I'm asking for. And certainly I want to make sure that you're aware that the variable specific heats is much, much, much more important than constant specific heats. Um, constant specific heats is useful as you're first learning about these cycles, like, like we had done not just in this class, but also your first thermal class, 301. Um, but, um, you know, the variable specific heat method is really the more accurate one. I mean, after all, specific heats do vary with temperature, so we might as well take advantage of that fact and use the equations that are the most accurate. Um, so it could be any problem, again, auto, diesel, Brayton, or the 
simple ranking cycle. Um, with regards to the auto and diesel cycle, please note that we only looked at ideal cycles, right? There's no such thing as reheat or regeneration or intercooling or anything like that. Um, we've never talked about isentropic efficiencies associated with closed system devices like piston cylinders. So, so we've got nothing like that. We, we, we just looked at the ideal auto and diesel cycle. With regards to the brain cycle, we did now look at the non-ideal cycle, and that's where we dealt with the non-ideal compressor and non-ideal turbine. We also dealt with intercooling um, in stages with equal pressure ratios across each stage. We, we also dealt with reheat. Um, between turbine expansion stages, again, with equal pressure ratios uh, between each turbine stage. Um, we also dealt with regeneration, um, where we're going to take the exhaust from our lowest pressure turbine and then send it back into a heat exchanger called a regenerator. And that regenerator um, is something that will improve the efficiency, but we, we can analyze regenerative cycles as well. So you could have any or all of those, intercooling, reheat, regeneration, non-ideal compressors, non-ideal turbines. I mean, you could have all of that in a problem. Um, and then lastly, with regards to the ranking cycle, uh, just the simple ranking cycle, um, nothing dealing with reheat or feed water heaters. So, you know, I think that should give you plenty to study over the next couple of days. So with that having been said, um, are there any questions? Um, again, maybe questions on the midterm that I might have missed, or questions on specific homework problems, or example problems, or anything that would help you prepare. Yes? Um, the loan flows are going to give us is air and water? Well, or I could give you refrigerant tables, but you're not going to use them for anything, because we're not including refrigeration cycles. So, I, I mean, the, the whole set of tables is what I'm going to pass out. But yes, for sure, you have to know how to use the water tables, and certainly the air tables, table A17 as well. Um, yeah, no refrigeration problems because we're not dealing with refrigeration cycles yet, at least on the test. Um, was there another question here? Um, do we have to know if turbines are air um, No. I mean, I even briefly mentioned that they're not particularly that useful out in the real world, and I never even talked about any methods of solution or any analysis. So, no, don't worry about those cycles. Yes? Yeah, I'm always okay with that. Um, I mean, if it makes it a little more quick for you to get through the problem, if you have a calculator that does interpolation, I have no problem using it. I think most students have you know, some sort of a scientific calculator these days. Um, if, on the other hand, you don't have your uh, calculator programmed for interpolation, um, you could just approximate as best you can. I mean, I don't want you to sit there for 10 minutes trying to do a real exact interpolation. If you know that you're between a couple of entries and, you know, you look at the numbers and you can see that I'm about halfway between the two, you could just make an approximation. Just make sure you state it on your problem statement that you're interpolating by approximation and, um, really it's just to save time. Now, granted, at the end of the problem, you can go back and, you know, revise your numbers if you have more time. In fact, I would just say in general, I would always recommend that my students set up the problems first, even identify, you know, which equations to use, in which order, where your data comes from, identify any unit issues or conversion factor issues, um, make it real clear how to get from one step to the next. I mean, I've given A's on exams when students haven't filled in a single number, um, but their method is completely correct, uh, right down to which tables to use and how to deal with it if it's two-phase versus how to deal with the tables if it's superheated or saturated, um, including conversion factors. I mean, so if you can describe how to solve the problem in all that detail, um, all you've not done is pull the number or two out of the tables and everything else should be correct. So again, I'll give you a lot of partial credit. So, so set up the problems first, um, at least that way. By setting up the problem, I'll see whether you understand the methods or not. And then again, at the end of the problem, go back and plug in the numbers and at least that way you'll maximize your partial credit. Yes. Um, some of you have the, the little booklets, the property table booklets. You know, it says property table booklet or something like that. Yeah, you can certainly use that. Um, but if you bring your own property tables, then I will flip through it and make sure there's no notes you've written to yourself or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I would encourage you to bring your own property tables. The problem with my property tables is I put like two on a page, so they're a little bit small. Um, some of you with um, vision issues might want to bring a magnifying glass. Um, I mean, hopefully it won't be that bad. I, I can read them. If I can read them, you guys should be able to read them. Uh, but nonetheless, um, 
you know, if you have the property table booklet, well, then it's just one page per sheet, and then it'll be a little bit easier to read. So, yeah, if you have your own, that would be fine. You know, if you want to look at the property table booklet that I have on Blackboard and just print it out so that, you know, each page is full size, I mean, that's okay, too. Um, yes? I will give you, no, I won't. Um, conversion factors are all in the inside back cover of the book, and they will be provided with the property table handout. So I guess that's what you meant. I'm not going to give them to you on an individual problem, but the inside back covers of your book include all the property data you would need. It even includes the gas, well, the universal gas constant with any of a number of sets of units. So um, yeah, I will provide that as part of the handout. So yes. So. Um, any other questions? Um, any questions on specific homework problems? Um, you know, keep in mind that I have no more office hours today. Um, Thursday, I'm not even on campus. I do have an office hour before your test on Friday morning. So, you know, this is really about the last opportunity you'll have to ask me anything directly, at least until Friday morning. Yes? Did you actually, I don't know if everybody doesn't have to stay for the question, but <laughs> Okay. Okay, did you have a specific question on it or just the, the method of solution was unclear? Yeah, I could certainly go over that. Um, problem 9 119 is a, well, a rather lengthy Brayton cycle problem with everything, right? Non ideal. Uh, compressors, non-ideal turbines, reheat, intercooling, and regeneration. So it, it's got everything, right? I mean, I'm not going to go through the numerical solution, but at least we could talk about it. So I would just generally start a problem like this by showing the maximum minimum pressure lines. And then also, since there's going to be intercooling and reheat, I would also show an intermediate pressure line. So this is always a good way to start. Um, we would typically use point one as the entrance to the first compressor. And in this particular problem, you've got intercooling. So you're going to compress from one to two. And now, if the compressor is not ideal, then you really have a 2S and a 2A. Um, then you do the intercooling right back down to the temperature of point 0.1. So these temperatures are always going to be the same. And then you expand, I'm sorry, you compress from 3 to 4s as an isentropic expan uh, compression. Uh, but then you'll go from 3 to 4a using the isentropic efficiency. Um, we'll look over here at the reheat part of the cycle. So this will be 6. Um, and again, we'll go through an assumed ideal turbine to get to 7S, but then you apply the isentropic efficiency to get to 7A, and then you reheat back up to the same temperature as 6, and then we go through the second expansion. Um, so we go down to 9S, and then we apply the efficiency to get to 9A, um, and then we move out of that turbine, and this is where we're going to go into the regenerator. So 10 would be the entrance of the regenerator on one side. 4 is the entrance of the regenerator on the other side. And we'll leave the regenerator at 0.5. Um, as we move through the regenerator, um, of course, the temperature of the turbine exhaust is going to drop. And then eventually the exhaust will have heat removed from it. And we're right back to state point 0.1 again. And let's just finish this by showing the process from 5 to 6. So that's the, the basic TS diagram for the cycle. Um, if we were interested in, you know, a schematic diagram, then we would show a couple of compressors. Um, we'd show the intercooler in between. So, you know, one goes into the first compressor, two comes out into the intercooler, three into the second compressor, and then four goes out of that compressor. Um, and then this is where we would have our regenerator. There's five, and then we would have our first turbine, and we would have a reheater, and then our second turbine. 
So let's see, I'll just put RH for reheater, six and seven. Um, is that right? Uh, I missed something. Oh, I forgot my combustion chamber. That's not good. Between five and six, we have to add heat. So just CC for combustion chamber. All right, so there's five. And now we have it right. So now six goes into the first turbine, seven out of the turbine, into the reheater, eight out of the reheater, into the second turbine, and then nine out of the second turbine. And then this is going to go into the regenerator. And I, I, I didn't draw this very well because I didn't leave myself enough space in here. I, I probably shouldn't have put the reheater right where I did. I should have moved it over. In fact, I'll have to move it over because I just don't have space. So seven, eight. There, here's our reheater. Okay, so now I can show the discharge from the turbine going back into the regenerator. And then lastly, our big environment as we reject heat and go back to state point one. Okay, so this is how it looks like on a schematic diagram. And then as far as the method of solution, um, well, we just have to look at what's been given and not given. Um, we do know the total pressure ratio. We know the temperature going into each compressor at 1 and 3. We know the temperature going into each turbine at 6 and 8. Um, so it's really just a matter of analyzing the compressor and turbines first. Um, you know, using the method of variable specific heats, um, we would have the pressure ratio across each stage of the compressor as just the square root of the total. So the total pressure ratio was 9, so it's just 3. The square root of 9 is 3. So we have our pressure ratio. Um, we know that the pressure ratio from 2 to 1 is equal to the ratio of relative pressures from 2 to 1. So P2 over P1 equals PR2 over PR1. So we start at point 1. We'll look up the enthalpy, which we'll need for our later analysis. We look up PR1. Um, we then apply the pressure ratio per stage equals PR2 over PR1 to get PR2. Really, this is PR2S, right? This is the isentropic process from 1 to 2S. Um, at PR2S, we then apply the equation for isentropic efficiency. Uh, well, I'm sorry. At PR2S, first we go back into our table and look up at H2S. And then we apply the isentropic efficiency for the compressor. That's just equal to H2S minus H1 over H2 actual minus H1. So that gives me the actual enthalpy at point 2. Um, and then we don't even have to do anything from 3 to 4, right? We've got the same inlet temperatures. We've got the same pressure ratios. So all your properties at 1 are the same as 3. All your properties at 2 are the same as 4. So we finish the compressor. And now we go over here to the turbines. And we do the same thing, right? We look up the uh, relative pressure at 6. And then we note that P6 over P7 is the pressure ratio per stage. It's still equal to 3. Um, and that equals PR6 over PR7. So we look up PR6, and then we find PR7. Um, we go into our tables of PR7, and we look up, well, again, I should say 7S. That's more accurate. Um, we look up at PR7S. We look up the enthalpy at 7S. We apply the turbine's efficiency. Um, H7, well, what would it be? H6 over H7A divided by H6 over H7S. In other words, the actual ideal work is equal to the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. So that gives me the ability to find H7A. And then we note again that 6 and 8 are the same, 7 and 9 are the same. So we've actually finished everything, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then also 6, 7, 8, and 9. Um, the last step is to apply the isentropic, I'm sorry, apply the regenerator effectiveness to the regenerator, right? Remember, the regenerator effectiveness is the actual amount of heat input, in other words, H5 minus H4A, um, divided by the maximum possible heat transfer. And the maximum possible would be if we could heat up from 4A all the way up to 9A, which would be the temperature of the exhaust leaving the turbine that's used in the regenerator. So um, whatever the regenerator effectiveness is, that's equal to H5 minus H4A over H9A minus H4A. Everything is known except H5. Now that we have H5, now we can find everything, right? We have state points 1 through 9. We can find our work. We can find our heat transfer. Um, we can find the thermal efficiency. So is that what you were looking for? Yes. 
Okay, so you know, I know all I did was really talk about it, um, but at least we know how to do it. Um, by the way, one last thing to note is that the lectures have been being posted on Blackboard. I'm pretty sure this one's not going to be available before your test on Friday. Um, but um, except for the one dealing with open feed water heaters um, where you know, they weren't able to record it last Friday, um, I think everything else, certainly everything that you need for your test should already be online. So you can look at any lectures you've missed. Anyway, that's all we have time for. Uh, one more question. I have in the past been uh, asked students to write a TS diagram or a schematic diagram. Thank you.